morning, everyone. Uh, so just, um, just of where we are in this course, I just want to give you a bit of context. Uh, we left the section then on centrifuges last week, and Krishlani, the TA, then started this topic of filtration. I'm going to continue on and finish the filtration topic and then come back to cyclones, which um, I would have normally covered first, but because Kushlani looked at filtration, I just want to finish that topic up and complete it. So she covered this idea and gave you an introduction to filtration. She showed you a few of these diagrams that of, of commercial filtration units. Here's one, it's a plate and frame press. So for those of you that haven't seen these units in person, this is um, really a, a, a good, as good an illustration of it as you can get. Um, it's a very large scale unit. Here you see the outer shell of the unit that comes and really pushes those plates together. And inside those plates, the cake is formed. So I'll, I'll give you an illustration of that. But here, for example, is the cake that will form inside the plate and frame press and is dropped out afterwards. Now, depending on the application, it might be the cake that is more valuable. In other instances, it's the filtrate, the liquid phase that is more valuable. So um, that cake then is formed inside these pockets. These plates um, have hollow openings for that cake to form in. And once they're formed, the, it drops out. So it's a very much a batch operation. Uh, Kushlani also showed you a continuous uh, filter press. Here's the side drawing of one. So you've got your slurry lying here. That's your mixture of solids and liquids. And this drum rotates on a continual basis. And on a continual basis, that cake is formed. You've got wash water just to wash out any final impurities. All of this liquid gets drawn into the center of the drum. There's a vacuum pulled in the center. So outside here is atmospheric vacuum pulled in the center to dewater the cake. So basically in this last section of the circle around the drum is where the dewatering occurs. And here's a knife that is, sits very close to the surface of the drum and it basically cuts off the solids on a continual basis. Okay, So here's a continual uh, filtration unit and here's a batch-wise separation unit. This, this uh, blue final plate essentially pulls back at the once the batch is done, and then someone manually comes and scrapes the solids off from the frame. Oh, sorry, from the plates, I should say. So, so and then here's a final one. This is um, uh, used in a brewery. You can see the brewery vats over here. You can see uh, the, some of the raw materials that they're using for beer creation. But if they don't do this step, the filtration step, the beer is very cloudy. Okay, so for those of you that have done home brewing, you get a very cloudy beer because of the finely dissolved solids. This uh, plate and frame press is used to do a clarification of that final stage. It's also used in fruit juices and other um, uh, manufacturing to clarify liquids from very finely dissolved solids. So what I wanted to do, uh, in this class is just to point out a few things that Kushlani uh, didn't uh, touch on. Um, let's just really understand the motion of the fluids and the solids inside a filtration step. So you've got some container, usually circular pipe, through which the solids and liquid phase is moving. So you've got your solids suspended in your liquid phase coming down in this direction. And somewhere over here in the pipe you have a barrier set up. And this barrier we called our medium. <coughs> and what will happen is that these suspended solids will build up against this barrier. They're larger than the openings on the medium. Okay. And the cake, as we call this, solid buildup here, is called our cake, builds up over there on the surface of the medium initially. So initially the medium just simply catches the first layer of solids, but once those solids have been caught by the medium, 
it's in fact not the medium that's doing the filtration, it's the cake itself that's doing the filtration. So the solids filter themselves. Just, just at the beginning, it's the, is the medium that's catching the solids. So that's critical to understand, and we're going to use that insight in today's class. Now, I will pass around a version of that. So this I use for making coffee every day. But um, you can see this for yourself. So here's the hollow tube through which we'll put our coffee and hot water in a minute. I'll show it to you. Here's a medium, your filter paper. I also have another medium here, a metal disc. And I'll pass it around and you hold it up to the light. You can see the very fine holes in that metal disc. So two types of mediums. The paper will have a different resistance than the metal disc, obviously. Um, so pass those around quickly. I will then bring it back to the front and demonstrate to you how it works. And that gives you an idea of a batch version of filtration for making coffee. But essentially, it's no different to what you've used in a lab scale, perhaps in first year chemistry course and done a filtration step in one of your chem labs. So I did, I did want to come back, however, to that first and second <laughs> equation that's up here on the slides. The first equation is your standard fluid flow equation that Dr. Latulip derived for you in 2.0. Okay? So there's nothing there that's surprising. But what we've done here is let's take a look at that first equation. That first equation is an equation that tells what the pressure drop is, delta P, for fluid flowing in a pipe of length LC. And the pipe has diameter D. Okay. Now, we don't have fluid flowing in a pipe. In this instance, what we have is our fluid is flowing through channels. And essentially, if we zoom in on just the cake portion, so here's my, my pipe and here's my cake portion. The fluid now is flowing through channels that don't have a diameter D. We're now flowing through these narrow channels. And it's very, very nonlinear. And we don't know necessarily how to deal with that. But what we do is we start with our standard flow through a, a, a tube, that first equation. We simply modify that equation. The viscosity stays the same, but the velocity V isn't the same velocity V. In fact, what is this velocity over here? It is a velocity which we call V over epsilon, the porosity. So you'll recall this void fraction or this porosity value is a number that tells us how closely packed our solids are. So a porosity of 1 actually corresponds to this case. Porosity of 1 is essentially no solids. Okay. And a porosity of 0 isn't something we can achieve in practice. Uh, we can never get down to a porosity of 0. But a porosity of 0 essentially would imply it's 100% solids. There's no gaps at all. Okay. So the porosity E tells us how much our percent void space is. So if we've got 100% void space, we've got no solids. And if we had 100% solids, sorry, 100% void space, we're saying V divided by 1 is simply V. It says then that essentially the velocity in an unpacked bed is the regular velocity. But if we're divide, dividing through by a number smaller than 1, that overall velocity term becomes a larger number. And that makes sense because if we're applying the same delta P over this region as in an empty region, the fluid has less space to flow, and it has to be flowing at a faster velocity. Okay? So we essentially get a modified velocity term over here. If we also come back to the, uh, to the hagen poiseuille law over there, the d squared is a representation of the cross-sectional area through which the fluid can flow. d squared is related to the cross-sectional area. Well, in this case, our cross-sectional area depends on how closely packed these solids are, as well as the surface area through which that solids travel. And so we get this modified term, which then is essentially the representation of the effective area for the solids. 
So the Kármán Cassini equation is simply a modification of the, the basic fluid flow law that you've learned that's up there, and we modify it slightly and we get a new constant K1. K1 there is roughly 4.17. It isn't truly a constant. It can be as low as 4 and as high as 5, but we can do a quick experiment to figure out what that is. Okay, so, so that's that situation, and uh, Kushlani went through this slide. I won't go through that one again. It's a simple mass balance that one can do to calculate um, the mass of fluid and the mass of solids in the filter bed. But I do want to point out this last equation here on the board. Cs is equal to A times LC times... 1 minus the porosity times the particle density divided through by the V, capital V, the volumetric, sorry, the volume of filtrate, capital V. This, it's a little bit confusing perhaps with lowercase v and uppercase v. It's, it's clear in the slides, but on the board I'll always emphasize it by drawing an extremely large v for volume. Okay, so there's one problematic term in this equation, and that's LC. LC is problematic. It's the length of the cake. We don't know that. We don't know it because we cannot look inside this plate and frame press and see what size that cake is. That cake is growing over time. We don't have a visual indication of what LC is, except in very arbitrary lab conditions do we know what LC is. But in general, we don't know what LC is, yet it shows up in our equations. So we're going to have to deal with that in some way, and I'll show you how we do that next. Kushlani went through these equations over here. Um, let me perhaps just jump over to this one, where I would like to emphasize an important point of flux. So we've got this term flux, J. And we're going to see it all the time in this course. And flux is something you have seen in other courses. It just may be not called exactly that. But this shows up everywhere in chemical engineering that we should have a discussion about it. Transfer rate divided by transfer area. And I haven't really specified here what is being transferred. It could be mass that is transferred. It could be energy that is transferred. In this case, we're going to deal with, with, um, with mass transfer of the fluid phase. But it works in any case. Transfer rate over transfer area is always equal to the driving force over resistance. Okay. And Let's come back to an equation we actually looked at in sedimentation. Sedimentation, we had this equation. I'll use the terminology, the notation we had back there. We said flux was equal to C naught times V. If you recall back to the sedimentation lectures, we were looking at the flux of the solids in a sedimentation vessel. And we had that equation, C naught times V. And let's just sub in there what we had, because I would like to emphasize driving force over resistance. This concept is an important one. So if we looked at that in the case of sedimentation, it was kilograms of solids per second. That's my transfer rate divided by the area. The area was the cross-sectional area of the sedimentation vessel. And if we sub in our values for C0 and V, well, C0, I'll just leave as is, but V was the velocity of the particles. The velocity of the particles, you'll recall, was related to this equation, 4 times rho P minus rho F times G times the particle diameter divided by 3 times CD times rho F. What is the driving force over there on the right-hand side? In sedimentation, what is driving the settling? What is driving the solids being 
moving from the top to the bottom of the sedimentation vessel. Gravity. The density difference, okay? So we see the product of those two here. There's the density difference, there's gravity. If I was operating a sedimentation vessel in a part of, um, in a different part of the universe where G was higher, I'd get a greater driving force. If I had a greater particle, different particle density to fluid density difference, I'd get a greater driving force. Okay, so right there in my numerator is driving force. And if I had larger driving forces, I'd get a greater kilograms of solids settling per second. Okay. What is my resistance? Resistance is telling us what is slowing down or preventing the solids from settling. <coughs> CD. That is, what is that term? Drag the drag coefficient, right? There was also buoyancy. Buoyancy was also another force counteracting those solids from settling. It's also a type of resistance. Buoyancy is proportional to rho f. Okay. Every chemical engineering equation where you're transferring energy or mass, you will always find a driving force, you will always find a resistance, and you'll always be able to express it in this general form. This equation is, is probably the most important chem energy equation. Okay? Every single concept we've dealt with in your four or five years can be expressed in that form. Okay? Go look at your energy balance equations for a, heat, for a heat exchanger, where you're exchanging or you're looking at the flux of heat so what, how fast can you move heat from one side of the heat exchanger to the other per unit area? It has a driving force and it has a resistance. You can always write your equations in this, this form. Okay, so let's go back to filtration. Filtration, we're looking at flux. And I want to emphasize which flux we're looking at. So let's just draw, draw our batch filtration unit again. So there's my outer tube that's holding my mixture. There's my medium. And on my medium, after a while, we have this cake buildup. Okay. When I'm talking about flux in this part of this topic in the course, I'm referring to the flux is equal to the, the flow of the filtrate, the liquid phase. Okay. We're not concerned about the flux of the solids. The solids are assumed to come down to the medium and they're retained 100%. We're assuming no solids move through the medium. What's the separation factor for that case? What's the definition for separation factor? Okay, go back and think about that one and try to answer that for yourselves. So flux is, in this part of the course, we're looking not at the flow of the solids, we're looking at the flow of the filtrate. So in this fictitious cross-sectional area, given by the red line, we're looking at the flow rate of the filtrate my filtrate is coming down, and I'm going to be looking at the number of meters cubed per second per unit area passing through that red line. So the flux, in fact, through the cake is the same as the flux through the medium. All the liquid at steady state has to pass through the cake, and that same amount of liquid per unit area passes through the medium. So the flux in the cake is the same as the flux through the medium for the filtrate, for the liquid phase. Okay, that's a critical understanding we have to, to look at. And this equation that's up here tells us what that flux is. dV by dt, there's your transfer rate 
of the liquid phase, the change in the volumetric flow per unit time, there's your transfer area, is equal to driving force over resistance. So what's the driving force in a pressure filtration? In, in, sorry, in a, in a filtration system is the delta P. That's my driving force. What is the resistance term over here? Well, we're going to define resistance as everything there except the viscosity. That's it's a, by convention that we just lump all of those terms, CS times V times alpha divided by the a, area A, and we're calling that our resistance. We call it RC. Okay. So that's, um, that was that equation over there, and it's, we're, we're going to come and use that one a little bit, bit more later on. We can also derive the flux through the medium. So as I said, the fluxes between the, through the medium and through the cake are identical. The flux through the medium has pressure drop delta PM. That's the pressure drop just over the small region of the medium, delta PM, divided by mu RM. Okay. And what we can also do then, and this is roughly where Kushlani left off, is we can add these two resistances in series. So like resistors in series in first year physics, you can also sum a resistance due to the medium plus the resistance due to the cake in series and you land up with this general filtration equation that's over there. Okay, so that's what we're going to use throughout this course. And we're going to simplify it in various, in various ways. Okay, um, Kushlani looked at this topic with you guys on how you might determine the resistance due to the medium. Very simple experiment. You just simply put pure liquid through at a known delta P. If you're running pure liquid, you've got no cake, so RC is zero. You know the liquid's viscosity, so you can solve for RM. If you want to determine cake resistance, well, now you know RM already. You can do the same experiment and solve for RC. And the important point, number three, is related to the fact that the ESA in the filtration step is the cost of the energy for the pressure drop. Okay, so that's why we want to focus on that topic, the utility cost. Now, let's get to some of the more interesting newer material. Any questions on that up to that point? Okay, so let's take a look here then. I'd like to just um, look at this idea of Let's see, if maybe I'll just skip this. I'll come back to this in a minute. We're going to see this uh, next week when we look at membranes. Um, let's, t let's go back to this equation here. So this is the equation we ended off with. Flux on the left is equal to the pressure drop, our driving force, and our two resistances in series. Now I want you to think about that piece of equipment I showed you at the start of the class. And Think about these two questions. I'm going to have you discuss them. And this is important. Why are we looking at which, fun which variables in that equation are a function of time and which are a function of the volume? Because we're going to have to integrate that, so we have to figure out which entries to bring over to the side of dv and which entries we have to bring over to the side of dt. So take a look at that equation there and uh, discuss which ones are time varying and which ones vary with the volume. And then I'll find my coffee device somewhere. Okay, which terms are a function of time?
or maybe by a process of elimination, which terms are not a function of time. No. Nope. Let's go through the list. A, area, cross-sectional area. Function of time or not? Constant, okay. Delta P. This is a tough one. Let's come back to delta P. Let's look at viscosity. Viscosity of the liquid, probably not going to modify over time. CS, the slurry concentration. No, this is our concentration of the solids per meters cubed of filtrate. That's our feed concentration. So it's constant. It's coming to our filtration step at a constant value. The medium's resistance. Okay, so this is the resistance of this medium that we're putting down first to catch the solids. Constant. Okay, so once we know what this medium's resistance is, that's fixed. RC, the cake resistance. We expect that one to change, okay? For the simple reason that RC is going to be a function of the, that cake thickness. As that cake builds up, it gets thicker and thicker. The resistance due to the cake goes, goes higher and higher. Alpha, the cake's resistance, specific resistance due to the cake. Let's take a look at this term down here. Alpha is a constant K1, porosity, and then S0, rho P. Okay, so any terms in there that vary with time? Rho P varies with time? Probably not. S naught, the area of the particles per unit volume. <coughs> Constant. Porosity. Will porosity change? Yeah, any guesses? No? Okay, if you're confused about that one, it's good because it can vary. There's instances where porosity is constant. There's instances where porosity is not constant. So we'll look at that a little bit more. Okay, so let me talk a bit about this filtration equation. There's two ways we can use it. And it, it will help answer whether delta P is constant or not. So I'm going to make some coffee. You've all had a chance to look at this filtration device. I've put the metal plate in here. So there's my medium. It's got small holes in it that you had a chance to see. Put it in at the bottom. Let's put some coffee in. And we're going to do a quick leaching separation step first. So as I put my hot water in, that's the leaching step. Give it a chance to mix and extract that coffee. Okay, now I'm going to apply the pressure drop. I can apply the pressure drop in two ways. I can hold a constant force onto this plunger. What's going to happen to that cake resistance? It's increasing. What's happening to the flow of the liquid coming out at the other side? Is it at a constant flow rate? If I'm holding a constant force, a constant delta P, is the liquid coming out at a constant rate? Okay. If I apply a force that gets more and more aggressive as it goes through time, I can get a constant flow rate coming out. So there's two ways which we can operate that batch filtration. One is to get a constant flow dV by dt. But to get a constant flow dV by dt, we have to apply an increasing delta P over time. Because we have to counteract that RC at the bottom that's getting larger and larger. <coughs> the other way I can operate the filtration step, and that's the way we're going to look at right now, is by keeping delta P constant. I can always do that. That's very easy. I can use a feedback control loop to measure delta P and make sure delta P is constant. And then 
RC, as you correctly said, goes up and up and up. So if delta P is constant, RM is constant, mu is constant, and RC is going up and up and up, what's happening to dV by dt? Take a look at the equation. RC goes up, dV by dt goes down. Okay, so constant pressure filtration has declining flow rates. So if you plot it over time, dV by dt, sorry, let's say, so we said over time, that's going to slow down. What shape is this curve going to have? I'll give you three options. If we had to integrate dv by dt and do this at constant delta p, so I'm keeping my pressure difference constant, what's dv by dt going to look like once integrated? A, B, or C? C, okay. We're going to get a faster flow rate initially, and as that cake resistance builds up, my flow rate is going to drop off, and I'm going to settle out. Okay, so the total volume, this is capital V, this is the important point here, is that capital V is the total volume of liquid filtrate. So in a batch operation, I'm going to get a lot of my filtrate coming through initially, and then I'm going to settle down. So it should be no surprise that we get that shape of curve when we go do the, do the work next. Okay, so I'll come back to this idea here in slide 25 um, in tomorrow's class. I do want to just quickly handle that integration here. So the way we do it is as follows. We start with that equation. I've marked V in red. And what we're going to do is to do this integral, we actually are more interested in, it's kind of counterintuitive, we're interested actually in the time. When we're dealing with separation processes, it's the time that's of interest. How fast can we get that separation done? So we're going to flip it around and get dt here over dv. And we're going to integrate so we get the total time taken to get a certain volume, capital V. That's our end goal. So if we go flip it over, dt by dv, we can group those terms here in orange, and we can go group those terms in blue. And what we end up doing is these terms in blue we call kp, and the terms there in orange we call capital V. This is going to be our filtration equation at constant pressure. It's very important that you emphasize that. It's constant pressure because when we do the integral, we can easily take delta P and put it out here. It actually appears two, in two occasions. It appears in the constant B and it appears in this blue constant, Kp. Okay. But we know that in, in delta P would have changed otherwise in, in other situations. In other filtration steps, delta P could have changed as over time, but we're guaranteeing here that we keep delta P constant. And that's why it becomes lumped up in, this, in the orange constant and the blue constant. And once we make that simplification, we can integrate this and we get this quadratic equation. And if you plot that quadratic equation, you get exactly what you correctly predicted was the form of the curve looks like, like this. So it says, 
There's your quadratic equation. I've just flipped it around a bit. I'm plotting <laughs> t on my x-axis, and I'm plotting v on my vertical axis. But that's essentially a quadratic form with constant b and constant kp. Okay, And constant b in SI units has that form, and constant kp has a very strange set of units, seconds to the per meter to the power 6. OK, let's, um, let's go ahead and actually try using this equation. I'll, I'll come, come back and talk about these practical topics next. But here's a chance for you to give this, give this a try and see if you can calculate those constants b and if you can calculate the constants alpha and rm. Now, I don't want you to use your calculators here. In fact, I've given you the answers. All I do want you to do is just plan your approach for steps one, two, three. Let's just do steps one, two, and three first. Okay. <coughs> planning is actually, there's, a, there's some subtleties here in this planning. So definitely give it a try. I want you to focus really on how, how are you going to get Rm. So if you've done, done some, uh, some exploring and some, some general planning, try, go ahead and try that first step of plotting V against T over V.
What does that plot look like, <coughs> roughly? Any people got just a rough sketch of it? Fairly straight, Fairly straight line. <clears throat> Let me just quickly explain why, why that was asked over there, right? If we're plotting V against plotting V against T over V. Um, let's just take a look there back at this equation that you just, we just derived over there. T is BV plus KP times V squared over 2. If you do that, you plot T over V is equal to BV over V plus... Okay, if I do that, um, I get the V's <coughs> cancelling like that, and so I end up with a T over V is equal to B plus KP times V over 2. Okay, so that uh, we should get a straight line with intercept of B and a slope of KP over 2. Okay, so that's, that's the reason why we were asked to do that. And if we look at, just coming back to this question of finding RM was uh, what I'd ask you to look at. RM, RM is wrapped up in this constant B. So if we can calculate constant B, we get RM. And we can do that because we know what mu is, the viscosity of our fluid. We know the cross-sectional area. And we know the pressure drop, which is a constant pressure drop and easy to measure. So those three constants are known. Once we know, uh, can get B, then we can back calculate what RM was. So that, that would be our plan to get RM. The fourth part of the question looked at getting alpha, the cake resistance. Alpha can be done in a, in a similar way. If we can calculate KP, then we can back calculate alpha because we know the area, we know delta P, we know mu, and we know our solids concentration, CS. Solve that for alpha. So there, that would be my plan. And just working backwards then is I need some way to calculate B and KP. Well, there, here it is. I can get the slope, I can get the intercept, that gets me B, and it gets me KP. So let's just write that out a little bit more formally. Over here, your plan. So the slope is going to be KP over 2, and your intercept is going to be BB. And then back calculate RM is going to be B times A times delta P over <coughs> U. And you can back calculate alpha in the same way as KP times A <coughs> squared So the answers are given there for you. You um, should certainly go try that out. I, I will just uh, quickly point out a subtlety with this, um, with this problem. Let's just actually plot those, those data quick. <coughs> we'll just get an approximate plot. So V here, we're given in units of liters. And the 
term T over V is given in units of seconds per liter squared. Oh, sorry, seconds per liter, I should say. Yeah, seconds per liter. And we're asked to plot V on the x-axis at 0.5, at 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the corresponding values are 37, 38, 48, 60, and 70. Okay, so that's where that approximately straight line comes in. You can go show for yourself um, the slope. There is 10.67. And the intercept is 27. But what's the units of the intercept? The intercept has units of seconds per liter. Okay. So just pay attention to that because the intercept is equal to B. But B here needs to have units of seconds per meter cubed. Okay, so just do, you need to do a straightforward unit conversion over there. So that's related to B. What are the units of the slope? Slope always has units of Y divided by the units of X. So slope in this case is units of seconds per liter squared. Okay, and again here slope is equal to kp over 2. The intercept is equal to b. So if the slope is kp over 2, kp, we can quickly cal calculate kp, but kp there will have units of seconds per liter squared. We need to bring kp into these units, seconds per meters uh, to the power 6 first before we go ahead with the calculation. So just be aware of those units. So that's your goal for this evening, is to go try that. Conversion of the units and then calculating Rm and alpha. And we'll look at Rc in tomorrow morning's class.